You are listening to the Logbook Project podcast, and we appreciate you tuning in. The Logbook Project is a global journey of a World War II pilot's logbook, collecting first-hand accounts of veterans, witnesses, and victims from all sides of this horrific conflict. The project is intended as a token of remembrance and education to raise awareness of the sacrifices made. We encourage you to learn more about our project at our website, thelogbookproject.com. Welcome to this episode of the Logbook Project podcast. My name is Lars McKee, talking to you from Sweden and from his tropical paradise of St. Lucia, project founder Nick DeVoe. How are you doing this morning, Nick? Oh, it's a little bit dark here this morning, Lars, as we just tried to figure out the time difference between us and getting that wrong by about an hour. But I'm <laughs> good to be here. I'm happy to be here to do this and to do this right. So this is just our second podcast. And if you wish to learn more about our project, what we do, why we do it, and how it all started, we encourage you to tune in to our first introductory episode. But on today's episode, we'll continue our journey and we'll pick things up in Japan, where we left on the last one. We'll be talking about two gentlemen that really made this project take off. It's uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy pilot, Mr. Kanama Harada and Hiroshima atomic bomb survivor, Shigeaki Mori. Maybe we should just start with uh, Mr. Kanama Harada, Nick. Who yes. was he? What was his connection to World War II? And what sparked your interest to reach out and trying to get his signature? So as I now know, Mr. Kanama Harada, whose name I've only been pronouncing incorrectly for the last seven years, I've been saying the man's name as Kenami. And if my family were here, they would laugh hysterically because I'm, I'm horrible with names. Anyway. So to Mr. Harada, I was at work and because of my interest in all things World War II, I suppose the various algorithms shot me an article. It was written by uh, Miss Rebecca Wright of CNN. I think she's based out there in Hong Kong. And she wrote a piece on this gentleman, Mr. Kaname Harada, who was a Japanese pilot, a hugely accomplished pilot. I think we were just talking before we started here. If you go on to, on the internet and Google his name, he's credited with something like 19 kills, although that may be, even that figure might be not, or at least open to I think to he debate. had, yeah, there were, I think there was nine, like nine confirmed and 10 that were shared or possibles. So I mean, almost double A's. Right. So this is a man who had seen extensive action in the article. I'm not sure if it speaks to every major battle, but he certainly was, He significantly, most people will know, of course, Pearl Harbor. Harada was actually quite disappointed because he was asked to stay and guard the aircraft carriers, but he was there. He didn't actually attack the, 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 you know, the harbor itself, but he certainly was there. He was also at the Battle of Midway, and he also had some skirmishes against some of the British Air Force in, in the, some other in the, some other theaters where he downed in one occasion at least uh, five hurricanes, so so here you have this gentleman. Obviously, I mean right off the bat, in terms of his his World War II record, it was of course very impressive. And then equally, what really caught my attention was how the the discussion of his post war life. He became a very outspoken peace advocate. He uh, and again because of the horrendous things he had seen an experience you know one occasion he i think it was at midway where of course the carriers were sunk so he had to uh, crash land his his aircraft into the water he was then picked up by another japanese naval vessel and when he was brought aboard he describes scenes of of persons um, in a bad way around him he noticed that there were people there in much worse shape than him and yet he was being given the the attention by the medical staff and he said to them you know know, please help these other person and they were like no 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 they're probably not going to make it but you you we can get back and you you need to get back up in the air so we're going to look after you and i think that was one of several defining moments for him where he realized that just the expendability of it all and that they were all just little little cogs in in the war machine So something about that really struck a chord in me. And I just thought, wow, this is a really interesting human being. Um, And I thought, all of a sudden, Lars, I don't know why, but somewhere I just had this this very spontaneous thought, 
would this gentleman sign my father's logbook? How cool would it be to see to see his name signed in my father's logbook? My my dad's logbook is only about a third of it had been occupied. The rest of it were just blank pages. Uh, in my mind's eye, I could see this. You know, it was easy to yeah. see. Of course, then it became well, okay, a great idea. And like, how on earth are you going to pull this off? He was suffering quite badly from the nightmares that he saw. So it would, wouldn't necessarily be seen as warmongering or anything like that, trying to obtain his signature, because it's it was certainly a very, very outspoken peace advocate uh, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it was just, I don't know, something about the mystique of the man. I didn't have any, and at no point on this journey has there ever been an agenda to forward any position other than, you know, the insanity of war. We're very apolitical we, we we not and for me the other big thing was that I just wanted to learn what is the experience that you or anybody has had at at the individual level what was your story that just has always and continues to appeal to me and so that was really my motivation his story was instantly captivating and I and I thought wow how amazing would it be of course, like I say the next challenge of course was how on earth am I going to pull this off and I reached out to Miss Wright. And she responded and said, yes, she would, she would contact the family on my behalf. And I thought, wow, this is great. So it must have been a couple of days later, she came back and said, yes, if I could get the book over there that he would sign it. So that was the first really major victory. Seems kind of small, but it was it, just doing something as crazy as that. Um, as I look back now, I realized that was sort of the, she you know, she was the first enabler, if you will, because this project has been all about persons like her all over the world who have said, yeah, okay, I'll help you. This sounds kind of nuts, but sure. So at the time I worked at an organization, the OECS, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, which is, you know, like you said, I'm, I live in St. Lucia. It is one of um, six independent countries that use a common currency and and share a couple of other communal administrative infrastructural uh, bodies. Our whole purpose is to is to administer the region collectively. We have diplomatic relations with with countries all over the world. So my boss at the time was heading out, and just so happened to Japan, and he was planning a, a trip. And I thought, wow, okay, that's another big piece of this puzzle that will come together nicely. I was faced with the difficulty of getting a book from St. Lucia to Japan. Uh, what is that, like 3,000 miles away? And then who in Japan would actually receive the book and, and help me to get it to Mr. Harada's family? So the answer to that came in two pieces because the, my boss was traveling out to Japan, Dedicus Jules, who became the first physical facilitator. So that was the first piece. The next piece was that I needed somebody in Japan, and that came in the person of Mr. Richard Howard. Richard is a New Zealander who's lived in Japan for many, many years. He's married to a, a wonderful lady there named Yoko. And so, and I had purchased a, a vehicle from him. So I had a I had a good relationship with him, and I reached out to him and I, I explained to him what I was trying to do. And he, being a World War II buff himself. He was like, yeah, sure, um, you know, why not? Let's let's do it. I'll help you out. So I thought, great. And then, as I say, my boss was traveling. The day finally arrived, and that was the moment when, you know, all the alarm bells in my head really did start to go off and think, okay, what on earth are you really doing? This is this is quite nuts. But I, I stuffed it in the envelope anyway. And, of course, this was prior to me having the, the proper sleeve that the book now travels in. These were early days, and I foolishly just stuffed the book into an envelope with no protective padding, no rain guard or any of those things, and I can I can see your face just cringing at the thought. <laughs> yeah, this is and where I'm starting to hurt hearing it, but yes, and, please carry yeah, on. Were, yeah, those were not good things. I was really naive and silly. But anyway, off it went, put it in the envelope, went downstairs. Um, Dedicus was getting ready to leave, and I said, look, would you just take this and mail it? And he looked at me with concern. It was a bit of, of an odd request. And I and foolishly, I ex also then explained to him what it was, my father's World War II logbook. Of course, he was then horrified and tried to give it back to me. And this went back and forth. And then I said, no, listen, just take it. So he said, all right, man, this is crazy, but okay. And he did. 
And I didn't sleep too well for a few nights after that. So, um, of course, my wife was was not very sympathetic. She said, well, what were you thinking? Anyway, off it went. And lo and behold, the book arrived safely. Richard got it. And that was uh, another another huge victory, you know, the fact that he had the book and it was safely there. So then I reached back out to Ms. Wright, I guess. And, I, and it's funny how I don't even remember the exact, you know, timing and sequence of these things, but I, I did reach back out to her. And she she also then in turn to the family and they responded and said, well, look, you know, he's not doing too well. Try back in a couple of weeks. Now, I should have mentioned, too, that at the time of the article, I believe it's actually written in 2015 and I came across it somewhere in early 2016 that, you know, he was 99. And um, so but in my head, you know, when you when you read about Harada's story, his profile, I was so sure that after all he had been through and seen that he would hold out for the big 100, you know? So I just, I just felt confident about that. And then of course, with the book in Japan and I'm getting ready to send it over to him and he's not doing so well. Okay. We'll check back in a couple of weeks. Well, the next thing I know, I'm looking at Mr. Harada's obituary and mm. talk about, uh, <laughs> talk about a moment of, Oh, right. Okay. Um, well, I should have seen that one coming. Uh, it, it really, it was such a, oh, that was a real gut punch, you know? The, the book was not with Mr. Harada's family at the point? It, it no, was still no. with Richard, right? Yes, it was absolutely with Richard because, of course, you know, we the, the thing about it, even from then and since then, is that we, we never send it until we get a green light. And at that point, point, the light was more like, I guess, orange, you know, pending hopefully his recovery and then being able to send it. So we were that close. I mean, we were really close, you know, and even now as I think about it, it was like, wow. But so, no, he died and Richard still had the book. That was the whole thing. And, 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 and just for listeners, that scenario has since played out. It uh, has. It has in, in other areas, other places. And, but of course, we'll get to that. I mean, yeah. you know, and so this is the thing. I come traipsing along into people lives, uh, people in their late 90s, early 100s, you know, I should have started this many, many years ago. But as in fact, and this is a, maybe a good point to insert here, because of the timing of this project, the average age is late 90s, early 100s, which means that everybody who signed this book was basically a late teenager, early 20s. And that's in, that becomes important as we take a step back and look at the mess that was World War II and the real horrendous crimes that occurred. And because the questions of, questions of guilt and culpability, uh, you know, come up inevitably, they do. But remember what I said at the beginning is that, you know, this, this is not a, any kind of political statement. This whole movement was to do two things. The Logbook Project is in, in, to educate and also to remember. Those are the two pillars on which the project sits firmly. And so that becomes important when we think of the signatories because they are global. They are from all sides of the conflict. And some of them were involved in things that... Again, we were not there, and I'm not here to, to make judgments, but at the same time, we are here to look and not, not necessarily turn away. Um, in fact, not to turn away from things that occurred based on the information that we have to hand. No, exactly. I mean, as you said, we're not political or anything, but as soon as you start masking the truth or, or, or trying to rewrite history, then, then you're on a slippery slope. Absolutely. I just also have a personal conviction that war is abhorrent. And certainly every single one of the people that we have met along this journey, people who have been on the front lines, people who have lived through horrendous things, not one of them has said, well, you know, that was really good. Yeah, I would like to do that again. No, that hasn't happened, right? So, I, yeah, to me, a world without war would be would be an amazing place to live in. So, I, yeah, maybe it's naive, but you know what? I would I would really like to see that. I would like to live in that world, even as we speak here now with two conflicts raging. So coming back to Mr. Harada, Japan was at war long before Pearl Harbor, long before yeah. even the European conflict broke out. And so, so yes, Mr. Harada 
uh, he was active in China, where Japan was present, obviously. And, and you brought to my attention an article written by Dan King. It's called A Japanese Pilot Remembers. And it's the Nanjing campaign, 1937. And, you know, so I would refer readers to that article. Um, and just to say that this is all part of his profile, but even within that article, his humanity comes through. And, and, and it only has reinforced my admiration for the man who was Kaname Harada. Uh, after the war, because of the horrible things he had been through and experienced, he and his wife actually opened a kindergarten uh, as a part of a, a way for him to, to just deal with some of the pain that he had been part of. His empathy really shines through in his life. Uh, so the two things together really confirm for me how much of a, a wonderful individual I think that he was and that he, in his war service, he was just serving his country. The fact that he never signed a book is interesting in itself because it, it actually creates some kind of a mystery, if you like, and it sets the whole stage for what happened next. Well, yes, without Kaname Harada and him yeah. sparking your interest in, trying, in, in reaching out and, and making the decision to go down this completely crazy path of sending your father's logbook all across the world over to Japan to have him sign, without Kanami Harada and his legacy, it, it would never have happened. And now, I mean, as we sit here, eight years later almost, it's 250-some signatures, and it just wouldn't have happened. So he was the gateway through which I jumped down this rabbit hole, and, you know, here we are today. Yes, absolutely. Without Kanami Harada, none of this happens. So, and like I say, it was very much his entire profile, I think beyond just being a very accomplished World War II pilot. So, and the funny thing is, we continue to discover things about him. And as we will see, as the story unfolds, I began to meet other people who had been not just knew of him, but, but knew him personally. And that becomes a whole twist in this story as we proceed. So... And I'm not sure, perhaps this is a good place to introduce a gentleman by the name of Marcus Perkins. He is a, he's a photographer and apparently coming up to the 60th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, he set out to write a feature to identify some of the, the actual combatants from Pearl Harbor and write a full length feature. And his idea was he was just going to speculatively create this, this article and then have it, you know, offer it to various newspapers. At first, he, he there was some, not, not pushback, but just not a hell of a lot of interest, but he was convinced and went ahead and did it anyway. And lo and behold, it, the articles were picked up and they were run. And one of the, one of the profiles he wrote about was Mr. Harada. So much so then that coming out of that, there was, as anything else, there was interest. The, the stories generated a, a good bit of interest. And Mr. Harada ended up going to England to sit and visit with one of the men he had shot down, a gentleman by the name of John Sykes, a British pilot that he had shot down over Ceylon. So, uh, and so the, there is a photograph of Mr. Harada, I believe with Mr. Sykes, and a Japanese woman, and her name is Tomoko Nishizaki. And I hope, Tomoko, that I have said your name right. Um, <laughs> but Tomoko lives in Hiroshima and is a translator. She's also, she's a research person. She's a fantastic resource for various persons who come to Hiroshima seeking to further study that aspect and theater of the war. So she lives out there and she served as his translator. Now, of course, this I didn't know any of this at the time. I was just trying to get to Mr. Harada's signature. However, years later on, in another roundabout way, I would encounter Tomoko. But we will get to that. And so Mr. Harada passes away and the book is with Richard. And I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, that, that was like, no, you have to be kidding me. Like, I was like, no, you know, that was such a... Were you at some point kind of thinking, hmm, 
All right, just no, get, get, get the book back and we'll we'll just be done with it. Or uh, what was your thoughts at that point? I was like, like, I was like the petulant child. I was like, are you kidding me? I got this book all the way to Japan and he died. I was like, no, you know, this is, this is not how it was supposed to be. But of course, anyway, I got, I got over feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, no, well, this is nuts. The book is in Japan. This is a country that has seen, my God, you know, this is where it all ended. And Lord knows there was enough. There was enough death and destruction over there. There's got to be somebody else in Japan who would have a story that, you know, the book is there. So let's see what, you know, see what else can we can find, who we can find. And it was around this time that President Obama, who was wrapping up his term in office, uh, visited Hiroshima. And he is, I believe, still the only sitting U.S. president to go to that city in an official capacity. And there, so up came a photograph of him in an embrace with a Japanese man at Hiroshima. And as I began to read that story, I thought, wow, this is, this is interesting. And the thing about the, the photograph is that it is too, it's, it's, not, it's not staged. When I say it is staged and that these two men were brought together, that was the plan. But the embrace, what is captured is not the president of the United States. It, it is just two human beings in a very human moment, in a, in a very vulnerable moment. So that, that was the intrigue for me at first. I was like, okay, what is going on here? And, uh, and you know, subsequently, even as I was going through my notes again this morning, I later on, I met Mr. Mori and he spoke about that moment and we'll get to that. But so that was the first thing. So, and then I began to read, okay, what is this all about? And Mr. Mori, as it turns out, was a survivor of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. He also, as I came later to understand, dedicated a big portion of his life to finding and connecting the names of some American prisoners of war who passed away in Hiroshima, who had been shot down over the city, and who he felt passionate that their names as victims should also be included with the names of all the Japanese, over 100,000 Japanese who died as a result of the atom bomb. And he dedicated his life to making this happen. And those names, I think there are about 12 of them, are now memorialized in the monument in Japan. So, you know, that took, that. I still can't quite wrap my head around the incredible humanity, the empathy, the the awareness of others outside of self that it would take for anybody to do something like that. You know, yeah. put this into perspective, Hiroshima was a city of well over 100,000 people and it was leveled. It was leveled in one moment and beyond the physical leveling of the city, there was also the radiation that, that horribly affected them and continues to affect them up to a day like today. I mean, up to today, 80, 80 years yeah. later, People are still living with the cancerous legacies of radiation caused by that bombing. So for this man to, like I say, his story, it really, it was deeply profound. He was an eight-year-old boy on his way to school at the time of the bomb. And yes. as far as we can gather, he was, he was walking to school, crossing a bridge with a couple of friends, and the, the atomic bomb exploded. And he was blown into the, the water below the bridge and probably for that reason survived it, but then kind of rose just up into the complete darkness. I mean, can you imagine that eight years old? No, I can't. He was three, about three kilometers away from the hypercenter, which is just in the outskirts of, of what would be termed as the death zone, really, and the blast zone. You cannot imagine. Nobody can imagine. So yes. Yeah. Equally compelling. Now, of course, interestingly enough, a completely different profile to Mr. Harada, right? So here you have a gentleman who's not even a veteran. He is just what we now come to term a witness, but of course, with his own story. And so that's another important point about the Logbook Project. Uh, we describe it as veterans and witnesses of World War II. So that story grabbed me with equal compulsion, if you will the same way Harada's own did. And it's interesting, even as I think back now, how in a way these stories found me. I never I never really sort of Googled, you know, 
veteran witness, nothing like that. These stories just kind of popped up. So it was interesting. Yeah. I didn't have to go looking. I, you know, other than, okay, Mr. Harad is dead. Who else could sign? And it just showed up in the news, you know? So. Predestined. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, you know, in that sense. Um, of course. So I reached back out to Richard. I said, look, Richard, this is the guy, you know, and his wife, between him and his wife, they figured out a way to contact Mr. Mr. Mori, who responded positively, except to say that he was going to the hospital. He was not a well person. And as I have come to understand now, that is all part of legacy from, from the radiation. That was the message uh -oh. that came. I just thought, oh my, this is not good. I'm, I'm definitely 0 for 1 here. And I hope this doesn't become 0 for 2. Uh, so I just kind of had to cross my fingers and hope that something would work out. And then a couple, I don't know, days, weeks later, message came back to say, yes, all right. He's back out of hospital and he would sign the book. So Richard sent it off. They sent the book off to him. And lo and behold, as Richard sent me a photograph over WhatsApp on my phone. And there was the two words, Shigiaki Mori, in English characters. And that was it. There was no date. There was no, no, nothing else added. It was just simply that. Shigi Akimori, written on the, on the last, the very last page of my father's logbook, and at that moment, you know, the lights went up. My head was just on fire in terms of the awesome thought. First of all, that this man had actually signed the book, but secondly, it was an epiphany of, oh my gosh, there must be so many stories like his all over the world. Who else could I get to sign this book? And that was the birth moment of the logbook project. Uh, and then, yeah, it wasn't a case of, okay, let the stories come to me. I instantly turned into this junkie looking for <laughs> stories, actively going out looking for stories. Um, but that was the real birth moment of the logbook project. I thought, wow, this is, this is amazing. It was just because it now allowed me to speak and to anyone hearing my voice now just to, so not just to hey, here's a story. Did can I tell you about this? But also that hey, was this man had actually held and signed my father's book. That just blew my mind, and still does to this day. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I, I continuously try to point out is the fact that every signature is actually put there by the witness or veteran themselves. In the very few cases it's been on behalf of, but for the majority of them. The book has been in these in, in the person's hands, yes. um, with his own very very personal uh, signature and dedication to whatever, and, and and that's that's a profound feeling to me. It's been in the hands of, in this case, Shigeaki Akimori. Yes, I know absolutely, and and like I say, it continues to send. You know, it's funny. So we've been doing this now for we're now in our eighth year of, of doing this, and. Sometimes you might be tempted to forget just how significant these things are. But every now and again, when I've seen the book, and the book's been on the road, right? It's done enough miles to go around the planet. What did we say? About nine times, I think? Um, yeah, I think it's a 350,000 miles or something in total. And Minimum. 250 signatures from all over the world on both sides of the conflict with varying uh, different uh, experiences it is a whole it's not and it's not intended to be a definitive source of historical material for world war ii it is it is more as we said just excerpts snippets of life of individuals who were there who have stories to tell uh to then hopefully spark the imagination of others to say well wow what was this really all about the other thing about history is that boy it sure can be convoluted and mixed up and, and incorrect, as we've come to discover, right? Even as we went to do this podcast, we realized, oh my gosh, you know what? Some of these, some of the facts, quote unquote facts that we thought we had were not quite right. And so there's always new information that comes to light and, and it, it's, it's not a perfect, you know, like I say, this is not a definitive source of, of historical information but we do try as much as possible to to get the facts right because they are important after all facts matter so yeah and we um, continue to encourage everybody to do their own research and and should yes. you just 
just springboard out of this to learn and to do your own research. Yeah. As I proceeded on from uh, Mr. Mori, uh, I, in fact, as I mentioned, his name was written in English characters, just that. And even that I realized, oh my goodness, how much more interesting would it have been had he signed in Japanese, maybe added a little note or something. So in fact, as the book has continued around the world, it has actually gone back to Mr. Mori because we also realize the man is married. Um, he's got a lovely wife. She's an amazing human being. She's also a survivor of the atomic bomb herself. And so she's also a signatory now. Then the second time I went back to him, he put, filled in his name in Japanese and he wrote a little inscription. And somewhere along the way, in continuing to understand and look at his story, up came this amazing documentary called The Paper Lanterns. And it is produced by a gentleman named Barry Frechette, who varies from the New England area. And Barry has a connection to one of those POWs. Uh, Mr. Mori dedicated so much of his life to finding their names. These men died at Hiroshima. Their names were unknown. And certainly it was heavily censored by the American government at the time. The last thing they wanted anybody knowing was that this bomb had wiped out some of their own citizens. So it took several years. And I think originally, as I understand the story now, Mr. Mori began his quest. First of all, the first thing you need to understand about Shigeaki Mori is that he has a burning passion for history and research. It's just in him. I think had there been no war, had none of that ever happened to him, Mr. Mori would have been in a dark room somewhere studying some other aspect of Japanese or some other history. Actually, let me just sidebar here for one minute. Hiroshima is a flat coastal city and probably one of the, the iconic memorials coming out of World War II is the Dome, which is uh, basically an industrial promotional hall. I thought it was interesting that it is designed by an architect from Czechoslovakia, which I, you know, it's just kind of strange. You wouldn't think so, right? So they didn't know that. Yeah. And so Hiroshima was a, was a big city for the time, still is a big city. And so there's definitely an international flavor to it. And so that cosmopolitan kind of mix, I think would have, you know, Mr. Mori being the person that he is, would have found something else to delve into in, with equal passion. But anyway, it is coming back to the story of the war. So he was originally trying to find out people from his neighborhood, his immediate surroundings who died. And somewhere in the midst of that, he started to come across accounts and drawings of these American POWs, which triggered his his natural inquisitiveness and uh, something about this story just fired this man's imagination. And so this is somewhere in the 60s, early 70s, perhaps, where he starts to just doggedly go after and find out their names. Um, I spoke to Barry last couple of days ago, and Barry said in at one instance, he wrote a letter, just addressed it to the White House and sent it off to America. And the, it was, in fact, received at the White House. And they handed it over to someone, I'm not sure if it was the Navy or the Air Force. And then in Navy. fact, lo and behold, that was a clue that allowed him to figure out another name. So, you know, and then and the other thing is, this is a gentleman who speaks no English. This is, of course, way before the internet was even a, a, a thing. Um, so his persistence, his tenacity is just, you know, th that he would dedicate so much of his life it's it's phenomenal he, he went actually out in his neighborhood around there in hiroshima and and taking statements from a lot of people surrounding yeah. any accounts regarding these blonde large u.s airmen that somebody had seen and just started to yeah. delve into that uh, it's, yeah. it's just completely um, amazing you know so and that's the thing um Coming back to Barry and that gorgeous documentary, and I, any, again, anybody listening to my voice, please look it up. It's called The Paper Lanterns, and we'll put a link. I spoke to him recently, and I'll let Barry, in his own words, describe how he got, just like Mr. Mori, into finding out about this gentleman and then having the, the wherewithal and the gumption to, to produce this documentary. So I was like, you know what? Let's just, let's just start. Let's just start. Let's just have some interviews. And then the interviews led to 
me finding Mr. Moore through Stars and Stripes magazine, and then and then and then Grant, uh, Harry Truman's grandson I end up finding, and I talked to him, and he's the one that kind of pushed me over the edge to like, yeah, I gotta go do this. Yeah. That was chasing him down because it was. A, I'll sing this article, Stars and Stripes magazine. This is the thing that literally was the spark for me. Yeah, it was Mr. Morey with the grandson of Harry Truman. And Mr. Moore took him to the police station and then was walking him all around locations where that happened. And I'm like, how the hell could, like, a survivor of the bombing, along with the grandson of the guy who literally said, yeah, we got to do this, having this conversation, I'm like, that, that's insane. Right. That, like, it just breaks every paradigm of, like, after all these years, how is, you know, this is where we're at. But people don't know any of these stories. So I was like, all right. Fine, let's do it. And thank God my wife was like, you're crazy, but let's do it. <laughs> and I, I found him. It took me a, like a summer, and I found uh, Clifton, and, and he's like, yeah, give me a call. I got I to gotta run to my kid's swim meet, but we talked for like an hour. And he's like, yeah, Mr. Moore's real deal. And I said, well, what's it like having your family's legacy? And I'm like, well, he was really clear, like, y- you can't undo the past, but you can, you know, do look at the, what the future is and how people are treating the past. And I was like, that's right. And that's what Mr. Moore is doing. What got him interested in is he, he's, he's a researcher. He got really interested in trying to figure out who from his neighborhood died. And he was doing the research on it. Okay. And then came across these, these images and then stories of, of non-Japanese people, people with blonde hair. And he's like, well, who are these people? And then he started to add it all up. And then, and then he then, couldn't let it go. Please look it up. It's called The Paper Lanterns. And it's really well done. It captures his story beautifully. You've had the uh, the pleasure of actually meeting Mr. Mori. I did. I will just give a shout out to my current employer, JQ Charles. They have an automotive division, and one of the brands we represent is Mitsubishi. And I was fortunate enough in November of 22 to go out there on a business trip. And of course, I took the opportunity to stay a couple extra days in Japan. And yes, I went and I met... Shigiaki Mori, my wife, Arlene, and I went out there, and it was just the most mind-bending trip. And so this brings me back now to Tomoko Nishizaki, who we mentioned earlier, and also a reporter from the Ashari Shimba newspaper, uh, Mayuri Ito. And the way I, I came into meeting both of these women was a sort of a roundabout way, but I have subsequently came to understand that Tomoko... In addition to being this, well, she's there in Hiroshima. And she was introduced to me by another gentleman by the name of Mike Mayer, who I met because of another story that we will get to. And Mike continues to be one of our huge champions and supporters. But Mike himself, uh, his story being completely tied in with Japan, um, he introduced me to Tomoko. And so I was introduced to this person as somebody who was living in Hiroshima, who could help me meet Mr. Mori and who could possibly translate. Only subsequently did I come to understand that, by the way, Tomoko also knew Kaname Harada and in fact had accompanied Mr. Harada to England on the occasion of him going there to meet Mr. Sykes, John Sykes, that pilot who he shot down. And also just a little side note, but one of the culminating things of that trip as it triggers my brain now is that he went to the memorial, Harada went to the memorial at Runnymede and had a very profound moment there. He said that's where a lot of healing happened for him personally and broke down in tears, which is another theme that is, is an undercurrent through all of this is that when veterans come back, having experienced the various traumas that they have, they're broken. They're very much emotionally broken and they carry this baggage with them. And everybody's on a journey to find healing and peace. I don't care who you are, but there's one ubiquitous thing that makes us human. Well, there are many things, but one of those things is that when we suffer trauma, we absolutely want to find that healing and peace. Some of us do and some don't, and every journey is different. And so that was one of the things for Mr. Harada there in England that he experienced. We will see that theme pop up time and time again uh, with the with the other signatories. And I, and even as I think back to Mr. Maury's story now, you know, this whole thing of wanting to find the names of these Americans and tell their families what happened, because they're the, coming back to the families, and even Barry confirmed this for me recently, 
the, all the families really were told was that their, their loved ones had been shot down, but they really didn't know much beyond that. And so again, you have Maury bringing that journey of closure, of some degree of healing, uh, you know, to, to, to allow these families to know what happened to their loved ones over there in Japan. That's so profound and powerful and relatable. Everybody can relate to that. You know, if you lose a loved one and you never know, it's just a horrible, horrible thing and it, and it haunts forever. So I was given this opportunity to go out and, and between Tomoko Nishizaki and Mayuri Ito, who is just the most amazing reporter with the Ashai Shimbun. And, and there were other people involved in the trip in Japan, and, and we will get to them as well in subsequent stories. There's other reporters who, who assisted us as well. But, th- you know, as relates to this part of the story, these two women were absolutely instrumental in allowing us to go down to Hiroshima to meet uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mori. We took the bullet train down. We got to the city. It's a, as I mentioned, Hiroshima is a coastal city. It is built on a on a flat delta. Uh, I think the name of the river is the Ota River, which comes into the city and then it splits up into five tributaries. So water, the whole concept of these rivers that flow through the city, the features are everywhere. And as you move about in the city, you're constantly crossing back and forth of these tributaries. And... Um, one of the things that uh, Tomoko explained to me as we were in a cab heading over to, to meet the Moris, she said that they have incorporated water into the features of the memorials, the various memorials that exist uh, around the city. Because apparently in the aftermath of the bombing, a lot of people were dying. And as they were dying, they were asking for water, water. They wanted water. You know, it was just part of the legacy of how they died. So this, this is part of how they remembered how this played out, water becoming such a, an important part. So yeah, I, we, we, and we went and we sat in his home and we met him and his wife and they shared their experiences with us as persons who had lived through and survived the bombing of Hiroshima. Some interesting little differentiations that they made where they, now, now it's very important for me to say this, that having been there, having met them, having heard them explain their stories, I still know absolutely nothing about nuclear war or what it's like to live through that, how, you know, the legacy of it. You, because I, only people who have been through it can tell that story. So I, 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 you know, and again, I encourage people to go and research. I can only tell you little snippets from my notes, you know, things that they said to us. Um, one of the distinctions that they made was that it was, it affected, the blast affected people differently, whether you were indoors or outdoors at the time. We went to the memorial, and as we moved through that, and boy, is that a profound museum to go through and see the different displays that they still have and see the story. Um, But what we understood is that on the morning of August 6th, there were a lot of... Now, Japan obviously had been bombed. You know, there was a lot of bombing occurring, regular-type ordinance of the day. And so as a protective measure, the citizens would go out and burn certain sections of the city to create uh, sort of like uh, barriers against regular bombs that would start fires and spread. So they would create, they were trying to create these buffer zones so that the bombs wouldn't uh, have as much of a devastating effect from the fires that they would start. So on that morning, as I understand it, there were a lot of persons engaged in this activity who were outdoors burning various sections to create these fire barriers. And so when the bomb hit, of course, they were all wiped out. That that added to the death toll, the immediate death toll, whereas persons who may have been inside may not have died immediately. And the Maury's also explained that, you know, they it's not frustration, but they already sense that some of the words that people use to describe what happened to them are, are nuanced and, and different to the way they would describe certain effects and uh, even of the, the bomb blast itself. So it, it was just interesting to see how these two people who had been through this, this horrible bomb, even as they still continue to live there in a wonderful little neighborhood that overlooks, because they actually live on a, on a hill that overlooks Hiroshima. 
how even there in their lifetime, with them still being alive, uh, already noticing that some parts of this story are being relayed in a way other than how they would like for it to be relayed. Do you think it's, so it's factual or just nuances? or It's, 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 it's kind of both. Um, just imagine your own trauma being described, not necessarily wrong, but different to how you would describe it. Exactly. You know, exactly. Um, here they are, these two individuals who've lived through it, who still live there, yet already sensing that some parts of their story are being, I don't want to say misrepresented, but are not being told in the way that they would prefer. And so I'm just referring to my notes because I did keep notes as I sat with them and even afterward. So she, and this is about Mrs. Mori, agreeing with Mr. Mori in our conversation that today's generation don't necessarily get everything right about the story. There's a word that they use and again, forgive my atrocious Japanese, but they, they, I phonetically wrote the word as pikadon. Pika meaning light and don meaning a loud explosion. This word is used, but it does not necessarily describe, I guess, the intensity and the violence of the explosion. They spoke about the way that it's described sometimes uh, is that there was, there was a strong wind that blew people away. But, and this was Mr. Mori speaking now, he says he, he witnessed bodies being ripped open by the shockwave. I apologize for the gruesomeness of this, but he, he spoke about seeing persons' organs just sort of spilling out. And he says not, it was not a wind, but it was just violent shockwave that did so much damage. Um, and so these are some of the things that they impressed on us that, that they felt were important in the description of this atomic nuclear holocaust that they lived through, right? Um, I was just going to add a bit to that in terms of the horrific scenes that Mr. Mori witnessed because the school that he was attending at the time, it was the Koi National School, it's now Koi Elementary School, it still exists. Um, it became an aid station uh, in the immediate aftermath. Uh, right. Aid station in the sense that, that injured people gathered there. And obviously there were a lot of bodies, a lot of people dying there. And uh, it also became the scene or the place for them cremating bodies. Uh, and that's part of the, uh, the legacy that he carries, uh, just seeing stacks of people being, being burnt yes. or cremated yes. on, on the spot. I mean, these horrible scenes of violence visited upon a child, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and you would sit, I, we sat, we sat in their home. It's very humble. The Japanese build things. They build a lot of things, but they build them small. So it's very, we get to his home and we sit in, in his living room, sharing it, this already small room with a grand piano. His wife is a, is a concert vocalist. Um, and so it's very cozy and we're all sitting together and we're sitting with them and they're just the warmest, most, you know, just welcoming people that you could meet. And if you did not know their story, you would never know. There's nothing that suggests, oh, by the way, you know, I live through an atomic bomb. Nothing, nothing, nothing. It's only because, you know, we, we, that was why we were there. So we got into it. But just the most amazing human beings that, that you could meet, just that, but, and just like anybody else, you know. So it's profound. And, and you sat in the man's home. <laughs> I did. We sat in his home and, and, you know, she, she had us the tea and it was, it was a really special visit. Um, and I, you know, I had the logbook with me and I presented it to him again and he went through it and he, oh gosh, I felt kind of embarrassed. He had given us one of the visits in the, the, the second visit of the book. He had, he had provided a photograph of he and his wife which I will just sidebar here because you know this well. One of the things as we've gone along is that veterans have inevitably wanted to add photographs, little bits of things that of significance. Uh, and they began to stick sometimes these things in the book. And, and it began to do two things. It began to make the book bulky and put a lot of stress on the spine. And then it was just bad for the paper, you know, with the glue and stuff. So we've had to uh, actually ask people not to stick anything. If they want, they can insert, which people have done and they've respected that. And we've now created a second folder where we keep all these additional bits and pieces. 
I mean, so it really is a, a two document project, right? And so the photograph that they have very kindly given us is separated out and, and, you know, as part of that. So I didn't actually have the picture with me that day. So I felt kind of embarrassed when he was asking about it, but I assured him that it was safe uh, with our very trusty webmaster over there in Sweden who documents everything <laughs> and makes sure that he keeps tabs of every single shred of anything that comes to be part of the project. So that is something that you have brought such amazing order and custodianship to the project, Lars. So I, I must recognize you here for that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, but, but please answer me this question. And I only came to think of it. As you sat there and spoke to Mr. Mori, obviously you had the book with him. And at the time of you meeting him, I mean, he was the first signatory. And at the time when you were visiting there, um, I can't, how, how far, well over 200 signatures later. It must have been 230, oh, yeah. 30, yeah, because 220, 200 plus anyway. This was, it was November was of 2022. Yeah, 200 plus signatories at the time yeah, so when you visited Mr. Mori. Did he, did he mention anything? What was his take on it? They were very, very pleased to be part of it. And they, you know, exactly. I did ask a question, you know, what, what, what did they think? And their thing was, look, just... Just tell people, you know, continue to tell people about the horrors of nu what nuclear war really means. And that was my takeaway. And I, I have that in my notes as well, that they felt they, they wanted us to continue to tell their story. That was important to them. And, and also, this is another important takeaway for me, is that, you know, conventional warfare will drop a bomb that will do physical damage. Of course, there's chemical, but just the conventional, you know, physical destructive bombs that will tear things to pieces. And that's horrible enough as it is. But, you know, once that's done, you know, you clean up and you tidy up and, and life goes on. You rebuild to the extent that you can. The legacy of, of nuclear war is something, it's just the horror. You know, so you have that, you have the physical destruction, but then you have the radiation that comes with it. And that lasts for years, um, you know, in the immediate aftermath. And here's another thing that was horrible. We then learned. So after the bomb fell and all this, this terrible destruction, you had people come rushing in from the surrounding um, prefectures, I guess they call them in Japan and, and neighborhoods and yeah. whatnot. And these people in their efforts to come in and help were equally exposed to the radiation poisoning. And so that's a big part of, as you go through the museum, you see that, you know, they, they, it's because it's part of the legacy of it. There are all sorts of horrendous cancers, blood cancers, keloids that grew on people's skin um, that, th that they've had to deal with for years. As I mentioned, up to today, one of the legacies within, even within Japan is that they had, the Japanese people had to come to the realization that, look, people who suffered at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they had to be uh, designated in a, such a way so that their ongoing medical issues are treated by the state. Uh, but that in itself took some time before people had an appreciation for the difference that they, in fact, had been poisoned by this radiation. And I, even as I went through my notes there, Mrs. Maury suffers with cancer. She, it was interesting because she mentioned about having, uh, I think part of her lung had to be removed. And she, but she wasn't even necessarily saying that, yes, I got this as a result of radiation poisoning. But she said, you know, in her own mind, she has to wonder if the two are connected. But certainly, certainly her father, Mrs. Maury, if I might just say, he was dignitary in the in the city, uh, he had some sort of governmental position, and he was one of those in the in you know in the period immediately after that was lobbying for this um, assistance to be to be hand, meted out to the person to citizens, and uh, and uh, getting a lot of pushback and resistance, and at one point had to take off his own shirt in whatever meeting they were at to show people the horrendous scars and and its growths on his back. Um, and and that I gather created quite an impact. So th and that's that's a big takeaway for me that people need to understand when we talk about nuclear war. You know, when you hear leaders today casually talking about introducing nuclear war, they really have no idea what they're talking about. 
They really do not. And that the horrible explosion legacy. is over in a matter of seconds, but yes. then the legacy goes on for decades and decades. And again, from my notes, Mr. Morey spoke about at that time the relative size of the bomb and the destructiveness of it, and then how much bigger and more impactful the bombs are that we have today. So, you know, it's depressing actually when you think about just just what we're playing with and and, and how cavalier we are and how desensitized we've become. Uh, and, and that, for me, is another important legacy of this logbook project, that we really sit up. I mean, I'm not naive to, to think that anything is really going to change, but my mother-in-law has a wonderful thing. She always says, um, don't say I didn't say. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I leave it at that. So when we, we left yeah. Mr. Morey's residence and we headed down back into the city to go to the, the monument. As we were wrapping up and getting ready to leave, I see Mrs. Morey putting on a sort of a coat and getting ready to, to head out. And, and uh, to my very pleasant surprise, she hopped in the cab with us and accompanied us down into town, where we then went to the site where the POWs had been kept at this police station. Uh, where Mr. Mori has has erected a little, very uh, modest monument to these men, paid for by himself. Uh, so it was a really lovely moment, you know, that she accompanied us and brought us there, and we were able to see it and be photographed with it. I've, I've seen she, the photographs. We, you sent the photographs, and they're re really profound to see. I mean, you're actually yeah, in that yeah. that location. To be in the police spot. station. Yeah. Was. yeah. To be of course, it's all, it's all built up now. So things like that never quite have the same impact. You're just basically standing outside a building. But yes, we went to the spot and she took the trouble to come with us. And I was deeply appreciative of what she did. She didn't have to do that. And then she accompanied us over to the memorial itself, the museum. They have it lovely. It's a big laid out area outside, big wide open area. And then you walk to the building and there's, a, again, these water fountains. And as we walked away from her, that's where we parted ways. I turned around to wave and she just stood there beaming and waving. And, and I turned around five times as we walked and she was there the whole time. And it was, it was a very special moment and sort of a confirmation to me of how much she appreciated us coming to see them. I will never forget those people and I will continue to talk about them as long as, you know, I have the, um, air in my lungs. It, it was just really Great. profound, just lovely, lovely. Yeah. So you went and visited the museum in Hiroshima that covers the, uh, the atomic bomb event. Yes. So it was getting a little late, but we went in. We didn't spend as much time in there as I would have liked, but it is absolutely profound. And and it's also, I was a little apprehensive because I thought, boy, this is really going to be, especially after speaking with Mr. Mori, I thought, oh boy, this is really going to be really brutal and hard to get through. And it is, It well, I say, it, the whole thing surrounds the death and destruction. So it is... But it's not, it's not overly gory. It's not, you know, it's, it's um, like it wasn't physically upsetting in that sense. I'm sure some people must find it very hard to go through, but I did not. But what did strike me, Lars, was the silence. You, you know, you're in there with all the people and it wasn't crowded, but there were people. There were certainly enough people. And, and, it's, and it's dark. It's purposely dark. The displays are dark and, you, and each one is sort of has little spotlights on it. But it's just quiet. It, that's what really stays with you as you move through this thing and the impacts of the various displays, you know, the clothing, the bunch of melted coins, the cutlery that's all fused together like a blob of wax from the heat, various things that, that just sort of, that, as you go through and just, yeah. just this. So you come out of there in, in, in a somber place, which of course you, you have to be, right? So, I, yeah, I would encourage anybody who's ever had any kind of inkling to go. Uh, it certainly makes a profound impact. The other thing is I, there's a there's a beautiful, um, uh, you know, montage, collage, I don't know how you, a big life-size up on the wall, like pictures of the city before and after the bombing. So you got to, as you're walking in, they take you along this hallway and you feel like you're walking in the city and, and there's a part where, you know, it's all built up and beautiful. And it was, it is a beautiful city and it was. And then as you continue to walk, they show the same area, just desolate, you know, this, this, this war zone, just everything gone, burnt and destroyed. And you still continue to walk. So they do a great job of sort of introducing you to that. So 
Yeah. So yeah, just a, an amazing, profound visit uh, to an amazing, beautiful country that I really would love to visit one more time. Uh, the people there, everything about Japan, just it, you can't go to Japan and come away unaffected. It, it's such a different society, at least to what I'm used to. And I am definitely a better person for having visited. The kindness that was shown to us, um, you know, still resonates. And I, yeah, I, and I'm so grateful to all the people who helped us. And we will speak of some of the others because, yeah, that was just one p- part of our visit there. We we had several other things happen to us that I'm excited to speak about in future episodes, but you can't touch everything today. So, no. I think that's probably a very good time to kind of conclude this episode. Um and I think what we should probably do is just to say a few words about the next episode, which would be from Ireland and Coram Perdon. Correct. To, so armed with one signature, <laughs> um, <laughs> I decided, yeah, this is great. I'm just going to venture out into the world and get me another. Uh, and so I must thank uh, Shigeaki Mori for but taking a leap of faith, he had no idea who I was, what I was about, but he signed the book for me. And I am truly grateful to him. But I'm also grateful to the ones who came after him, you know, the first handful, the first 10 or so. Uh, as you point out, Koran Pudon being the next one. Again, because I had really had nothing of a track record. And yes, this this gentleman whose story is, you know, it, it's a, probably a series worth of podcasts by itself did sign uh, as did mr sydney yeah. knocks down in trinidad and and we will get to their amazing stories next yeah i'm actually going to say which is going to re- relate to the next podcast i'm going to say on that bombshell <laughs> we'll compl- conclude this episode and you'll understand in the next episode why thank you thank you you have just listened to an episode of the logbook project podcast a non-profit initiative seeking to illuminate and preserve some of the veteran legacies of world war ii to contact us or obtain more information about our project, please visit our website, thelogbookproject.com. We would love to hear from you and thank you for listening.